tell us a little bit about uh, who Cedric Robinson was. Just kind of give us a sort of four, four, five minute highlight reel of his life. I mean, this is we got to get into some of the weeds of his work in a minute. And just part of that, it's interesting since we just spoke about Atima Feja, he also comes out of anthropology. He was also a student of anthropology. And the last quick comment, which I hope you can highlight, he also was influenced in the writing of his big book, Black Marxism, by ideas and debates about South Africa. And another similarity, sorry, quickly, is that his, his, the writing of his PhD also was tricky. He couldn't really, uh, Robinson's PhD was contested by his dissertation committee. So there's all these similarities. Yeah, I just want to say thank you all for inviting me to talk about um, you know some new work that I'm working on. Actually, the book is done, and so oh, excellent! Oh, I was just congratulations. The introduction it'll be out in uh, the UK in September, and in the US it'll be out uh, at the end of October. So, um, so the work that I did is really inspired by the fact that you know Cedric Robinson, you know, I, he's an African. That's how. That's the first thing I would say about him. And although, you know, he's born in Oakland, right? He, there's a very African uh, sensibility that, it, that grows over time, um, both culturally and intellectually. And so by the time he gets to uh, college, which was not expected uh, for black folks born in West Oakland in 1940, right? Um, by the time he gets to Berkeley, he's looking for more, more of Africa. And so, um, you know, Nell Irvin Painter, who was a classmate of his at the time, told me that the reason that they majored in anthropology is because they were looking for non-white people in the curriculum. There's no black studies yet, right? Um, and so the only place that you could find non-whites uh, was in anthropology. And so he switches from a pre-med major to um, majoring in anthropology. And then um, that's around 1960. And two years later, he's in Southern Rhodesia. Um, and so, you know, he's part of Operation Crossroads Africa. Uh, you know, founded by James Her Herman Robinson as a kind of, you know, Cold War era pro-U.S. foreign policy, Africa, volunteerism initiative. <laughs> but yeah. he has his own agenda when he goes to Southern Rhodesia. And he starts to hang around, you know, the folk who are organizing as part of Zimbabwe African People's Union. And that ruffles the feathers of the white settlers because here you have supposedly these Americans who are supporting, you know, white liberal interests and they are going around and messing with the African nationalists. <laughs> and so that was who he was. And so um, it wasn't just, on, it wasn't only him, but he was very much moved by that. Um, um, he meets uh, Reverend Indabagini Sitole, he meets Joshua Nkomo, he meets Joma Kenyatta when they go to Kenya. Like he secretly tapes the rally <laughs> of, the, of Zapu and uh, actually Kanu, because um, they went through Kenya as they were getting to Southern Rhodesia. So there's a picture of him, you know, with Jomo Kenyatta on, on Kenyatta's farmland, um, you know, during that time. And so Africa was extremely important because he's also organizing with the Afro, with the, with the roots of the Afro-American Association, which is the black nationalist formation out in the area, which is largely because of the independent struggle on the continent, connecting that to the revolutionary struggles in the diaspora, including uh, Cuba and you know so on and so forth and so um africa is actually uh, central and um you know Sh sharpville happens when he's in in undergraduate um lumumba is assassinated when he's in, when he's an undergraduate and that and that is shaping his approach to activism he, he comes in contact with also with robert f williams and malcolm x during his period of undergraduate of undergraduate work. And so all of that is really, you know, central to who he becomes and Africa sits at the center of it. And so by the time he gets to graduate school, you know, he studies the Ilatanga peoples of Southern uh, uh, Rhodesia, which is now, well, actually what is now really Zambia. It's really shaky because they, and he talks about this is that they didn't create what we know as a, as a state. And so he uses the Ilatanga as an example in his dissertation of a group of people who don't create society around questions of the political. And that becomes his entree into a kind of a black studies approach to knowledge because ultimately for him, the disciplines created 
models of existence and categories of life that didn't map on to how African people actually live, which was now an opening for Black studies to do something differently. And so he takes that to world systems theory in its formation um, when he goes to Binghamton as a professor. And ultimately, a lot of what he proposes to world systems theory is never adopted or it's adopted much later after he's gone, which has to do with not only the role of Africa, but the role of African people in opposing the world system. And that is the basis of what he does in Black Marxism. And the one thing I'll say about Black Marxism, probably more than one thing, but one thing I want to emphasize about Black Marxism is one of the critiques is that where is Africa, right? Um, and Africa is there, right? There's a small section called Africa Revolt at the Source. But that was going to actually, he planned for that to be the preface to an entire second volume on Africa alone. And so the idea, the theories of Black Marxism or the content of Black Marxism absolutely apply to the African, the continental African situation. The only problem was that that volume never appeared. And so it gets framed as if Black Marxism is not about Africa, but that volume would have been, um, you know, and I've seen some of the outline for it. It would have been centered around the ideas of another important African revolutionary, Amakar Cabral, who for Robinson was one of the most important components, person, personas of black radical intelligentsia. And he's doing what all that. He, sorry, I just wanted to ask, what did he mean by that term? Because he, you mentioned now uh, Cabral is belonging to black radical intelligentsia. Robinson yeah. proposes the idea of a black radical tradition. What right. did he mean by that? So the tradition and the intelligentsia are not the same. The tradition is the actual resistance activities of African people to the system, right? And that didn't require intellectuals for it to exist. The intellectuals were required in order to sort of elevate it into a theory for people who may need words to translate those actions, right? Or need words to inspire those actions. And so the intelligentsia or Robinson argues had to discover the larger tradition. And in many ways they discover it after finding the absences or the critical silences within other radical traditions of this, of this idea of black resistance, right? And so Cabral is interesting in that sense because Cabral, you know, revises Marx to sort of meet the requirements of the revolution that he was actually involved in um, in Guinea-Bissau and then revising Marxism, of course, that enables the cultures of resistance that, you know, enliven the lives of the peasantry, the seed of opposition that sort of guided how they, you know, viewed the world around them and colonialism as a force in that world around them to come up with an authentic theory of revolution, right? And so, you know, Robinson writes about Cabral two uh, in two places, in, in, in Radical America, um, which was, uh, who was it? I think it was, um, the name's escaping me now. Herbert Gutman, I think, is involved in that uh, publication. Um, but that is his extended treatment of, of Africa. But I was, what I was gonna say is he's also organizing, right? He's a part of the anti-apartheid struggle, not only um, engaging, those, engaging it in England around the whole concept um, of racial capitalism, but also when he comes, comes back to Santa Barbara. Um, and so there are black people in California, right, that are organizing around anti-apartheid in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and he's involved in that work. And he ends up um, in 1999 at the University of the Wits at a conference on Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so, I mean, there's so many ties that we can draw. And in fact, there's actually, I think, enough for a book, literally enough for, for a book on Cedric Robinson and Africa, Cedric Robinson as an Africanist even, right? Um, and so that's um, very much connected to this whole conversation. Now, um, about the South African connection to racial capitalism, I'm not totally sure um, about that because there's no, there's really no archival trace right. uh, of this in, in Robinson's private archive. So I can only speculate about what that can, I, I can only speculate about what the connection was. He, of course, knew these folks, right? There's a very real, um, cause they're in the same circles in London. Right. Um, but in terms of the inspiration for the term, the inspiration for the concept, you know, it's interesting Robinson, the chapter that he writes that uses the title racial capitalism and black Marxism is already written by the time he gets to London. So the concept that he's sort of outlining 
you know, it's already in place because of his previous relationships with radicals in the Detroit circles and Arbor, that vortex, his engagement with, you know, people like CLR James and others and, and, you know, that portion of his life. But I think there was maybe an attempt to sort of connect it to um, some of the language that was being put forward and to also extend and broaden that language to include something much larger than I think than what I think the South Africans were doing with the concept right. to right. Western civilization itself, right? Not just the anti-apartheid struggle, but how that's part of Western civilization yeah. itself. But in terms of a direct, you know, like documented connection, it's very hard to find that. Um, between the there's, there's usually what people will say is that at that time, there's this group in the ANC who's, who's, who's questioning like the ANC's conventional understanding of capitalism in South Africa. So this mm -hmm. guy, Martin Legassi, who actually studied in the US, mm -hmm. I think in the 60s, Neville Alexander, who's, right. who's a sort of unity movement figure from the sort of what we just talking earlier about Achim Afeje mm -hmm. and, and um, David Hemson, who I know listens to the program. I don't know if he's, if he's watching today, but mm -hmm. so there's, there's this kind of, it's interesting that you said it's stuff has already been written because mm -hmm. usually he's right. People sort of say they, he's in England, he's around CLR James. Right. Uh, so that's where you're picking up Steve Stewart Hall. So that's where you're picking up these sort of arguments about racial capitalism. I wanted just to ask a related question to this. What is his relationship at, during these moments with other black American kind of radical thinkers? Because you said also he's talking to people in Ann Arbor. The, I, I'm assuming you mean like SDS and all that. But can you well, say like, what is his relationship? Before you answer that, before you answer that, what, where does he like sort of fall, say, with, with other people who are also making thinking, writing at this time, and even later into the 80s, like, you know, somebody like, I don't know, Manning Marable, or or Harold Cruz, or yeah. Adolf Reed, or like Gerald Horn, or Angela Davis, like, where does he fit next to those people? I was a, that was a crazy group, but I'm just yeah. thinking, like, you think black American radicals who are doing, you know, what you say, this kind of like, mm -hmm. thinking world, thinking world systems, thinking like, you know, making the connections, like, how do he relate? How does he relate to all those people, for example? Robinson had a relationship with every single person that you named. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so it, it goes back to the early 60s, though. So you have to work through his life when he's in the Bay Area because there's so many opportunities to get involved in radical political organizing, even before the Black Panther Party is founded in 1966. And so, you know, when I was actually in Oakland, you know, tracing some of this, you know, a lot of the librarians said, oh, you mean the Panthers? And so they start, they start, their orientation is 1966 forward, because that's when Black Power started. And it's like, no, it's 1958, 59, 60, with the independence of African countries, and that's inspiring these Black folk who are organizing. And so, and even before that, because you want to talk about radical um, anti-capitalist uh, anti organizing, right? And so early on in Cedric's journey, um, after he comes from Africa, and so he's meeting, he's already met Kenyatta, he's already met Nkomo and these folks, then he meets William Patterson and Louis Thompson Patterson. He meets Matthew and Evelyn Crawford. These are old school anti-capitalist organizers. And it's not altogether clear what he learned from them beyond the fact that there is an intellectual tradition of engaging with radical leftist organizing. And so he connects that with what he was experiencing as a black power before there's a concept of black power as such in the late 1960s with his work in Berkeley. And so he had already met Malcolm. He had already engaged Malcolm. He had already met Robert F. Williams. The engagement for Malcolm X, right? Say it again, you kind of broke up. And I said he, he had organized, I think, a speaking engagement for Malcolm X, yeah. Um, in 1961, right? In the same spring, he brings in Robert F. Williams, right? And when Robert F. Williams and them got in trouble, he organizes, he creates an organization called the Bay Area Committee for the Defense of the Monroe Defendants in late 1960s. We don't know, Robert F. Williams is a sort of like proto arm struggle, if you want, yeah. right? African-American kind of radical politics in the 60s. Yeah. Right, it's the arm of radical self-defense, radical in some cases guerrilla warfare in the United States South, right? And so all of that is already in his mind 
in, 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 while he's in, at the age of 20, 21. And so by the time you know he enters the academy, it's to represent that pol political struggle in in theory, in words, in concepts. And so he's aligning with people that are doing that kind of work in black studies. And so some of the names uh, that you mentioned, um, you know, Manny Marable in the 1980s, there's a relationship in the early 1980s. Um, there's actually an attempt to bring Manny Marable out to um, University of California. You know, um, Angela Davis, you know, there's a relationship with her. Um, also an attempt to bring her out to Santa Barbara, but they do get Gerald Horn to come. And so Gerald Horn and Cedric are on the same faculty in Black Studies. Um, actually, Gerald was in the Department of Black Studies while Cedric was in the uh, Center for Black Studies. And so they're, they're, they're actually there at the same time. Um, so, I mean, if you really connect these particular figures, Robinson would have been, you know, at, at the very least in conversation with them. Um, but he's also, you know, struggling to maintain the status of the Center for Black Studies. He is also involved in political organizing in Santa Barbara. So there are a number of groups out there, including the local ACLU that he works with, the George Washington Carver Club that he works with, because um, the Black community is very small, but it was um, also connected to many of the same struggles that you see with Black communities in the 1980s in California, in 1990s in California. Especially and to ask a question, sorry, to ask a question about that because it's yeah, it's it's fascinating for me to to sort of get in touch with this history, which I think is is so unknown to most people. Which is that uh, Cedric Robinson was rooted; he's rooted in organizing, right. and he was an active intellectual. So I'm curious to to know what his theory of organization was. So. In a, in a country like the United States, and this is a debate that persists till, till today, yeah. um, how, how does he think black Americans, for example, should be organized? So should they be organized as the black community? Should they be organized according to class? And if they're organized according to class, is there potential for um, their solidaristic organization with, for example, white workers? So yeah. how did, how did his, his thinking about racial capitalism and class at the time influenced his views on organizing? I mean, that's, that's a complicated question for a number of reasons, but I would say that as a whole, you know, Robinson would have aligned with anybody willing to undermine and overthrow white supremacy, the racial capitalist system as a whole. And that meant, you know, also having a deep sense of international solidarity, international connections. And so one area, his most, I think one of perhaps his dominant area of organizing was media activism in the late 19, um, and really the, the 80s and 90s when they wanted to make the connection between United States imperialism and what was happening in Grenada and Iran and Nicaragua and other parts of the, of the world. They used media to raise awareness in the United States and particularly in Santa Barbara about these particular connections that we must have. We must, and, the, and the idea was that we must struggle with all oppressed people. And for him, that meant a clear recognition of the role that the United States foreign policy plays in really perpetuating these racial and colo racist colonial systems of control and of power. And I think a lot of that probably comes out of, you know, the influence and arguments really with C.L.R. James, who he actually meets in, in the early 1970s when he's still in the United States of America living in Washington, D.C. Um, so also the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, the Detroit piece, is not the SDS, it's actually the League of Revolutionary Black Workers um, that sort of provides the connection between the Black Studies program and Michigan and radical activism on the ground in Detroit. And the contradictions galore of the League, of course, presents opportunities for clarifying a lot of what you argue or um, what you, what you, uh, in terms of the question that you've asked around the questions of how you struggle. But I think for Robinson, it was straight up solidarity, period. And anybody that's, you know, struggling against, you know, white supremacy and, and all of his various manifestations, we have to, have to align with. And he was also very strategic in understanding the nature of that solidarity. It wasn't the kind of solidarity that meant you had to erase who you are. 
And so he would often talk about how, um, you know, his blackness was what gave him the ability to see and to think and to orient himself towards the nature of the beast. And that goes back to his grounding with his, his grandfather and his aunt, like early life. And so that never leaves him. You know, at the end of Black Marxism, he says, we must, we, we must, we must remain one with that. Um, even as we struggle with other people, um, you know, he was talking in, a, in a, probably one of his last lectures in 2015, I think this was actually on YouTube, about how you know, it was because someone, you know, instilled in me a sense of pride and understanding of my blackness that I was able to understand the, the nature of what police brutality actually represented and how that as an arm of the state, when it is a very particular um, manifestation and condition of white supremacy that struggle against us as black people, even as we are people of the world. And the idea is that your blackness doesn't negate your connection to other people. Meaning blackness is simply a way that the black radical tradition is a way of creating space and creating the idea that others are part of this common project of humanity because it is the black radical tradition that says we, we will not sustain the idea that people are property. We will not sustain the idea that land could be held in private and be used as, as an exploitable product. It's the black radical tradition that gives us that. And so it's not a position of it's just us. It's a position of here are the ethical kind of here are the ethical what is Lincoln said, what is Lincoln says these are the guys to existence as mm. opposed to you know the rule or the way of life. No, this right. is a guy to how to be. This is a guy to how to exist. And so that right. always common to other people. So here's my I wanted to just follow up on that. In your book, so one of the things that is interesting more recently is of course. Uh, Black Lives Matter activists, they're picking up on Cedric Roberts. And if you're on Twitter or on social media, you know, people yeah. are also the quoting him left, right, and center. It's interesting. We're also finding that in struggles elsewhere on the continent, that you have young, you know, new generations of young African activists, intellectuals, and so on, they reading Black Marxism. Mm -hmm. Can you say in your book, do you deal with this, this kind of, you know, is this an American? Is, is Cedric's work mostly applicable, say, to the American social condition, or can it work elsewhere? Is that something that you, you sort of answered a little bit of it already by saying this is not a rule book, it's a guide. So right. if you're living in Cape Town in South Africa or in in uh, in southern um, southern Zimbabwe or in, in Nairobi, Cedric can say something to you. Can you say a little bit about that, uh, about, about, about why he's making a comeback? It's absolutely Pan-African in orientation. And, you know, in fact, if you, if you're reading it and thinking it's an American text, you're missing the, I think you're misreading the text. That's my personal. <laughs> um, so it's, 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 it's diaspora wide, it's Pan-African, it's all of those things because ultimately the black, black existence in the modern world is, is Pan-African, right? And so for him, that chapter, chapter six in the text where he goes through starting in 16th century Mexico and coming all the way to 19th century South Africa and stopping in Jamaica, stopping in Colombia, stopping in Venezuela, stopping in Cuba, stopping in Haiti, stopping in the United States, stopping in Barbados. He continuously is giving a Pan-African theory of black common revolutionary ideas. And ultimately it's the ability to live free right, to live free of the imposition of the system of racial capitalism, which is at the core of every struggle in the black world, right? The ideological difference is how you get there, but the, but the, but the desire is something that we have to seize on, right? Mm. I this all the time, it's very few of us, right? Very few black people don't see that, there are very few black people that, that, that uh, don't see the system as a problem, right? <laughs> the question becomes, how do we get to there? But we have to be, we have to seize on the on that on that on that reality that you don't have to convince black people that something is off. Right? And so the question becomes, how do you get to a point where you can live free of that? And for Robinson, that changes over over time, right? It's it's 
clear in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries that one, in order to live free of that, one becomes a maroon, right? All right. By the time the 19th century, you know, occurs in the, in the industrial, you know, adolescence of capital, capitalism is coming to existence, revolutions start to be more of an assault, um, more of the assault that we that we perpetuate. And then once formal colonialism happens, there's another struggle that, that another level of struggle on the continent and, and, and in the diaspora that we have to that we have to struggle with. And the anti-colonial independence movements, I think, is really, you know, when he's in Southern Rhodesia in 1962, I think it is those movements that give him a sense, really, of the Black radical tradition as the people's struggle. Like, he has to break from the liberal do-gooder mindset and literally go to the villages, go to the meetings of the Zapu, and that's where he gets a sense, I think, I, that's, I mean, that's the beginnings of Black Marxism uh, in terms of this notion that the people, the people decide for themselves. Right, and, and struggle, and they decide for themselves that this doesn't come from an imposition of some type of ideological framework or some, you know, set of doctrines that then they have to apply. No, look at what look at what you know what's happening, you know, in this village as they struggle against literally settler colonialism, and I think that shapes him in in innumerable ways. And and the other thing that shapes him, of course, is growing up in West Oakland, where people have to figure out how to survive every day. So to ask I mean, maybe, no, I was gonna say, Oakland is unique. I mean, like the the kind of radical, you know, sort of radical black internationalist politics of Oakland is is, and in the U.S. it has had its own unique age. But sorry, William, you go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to 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 maybe as a I suppose a, a final question and to bring it all together. You're talking how about. Robinson sort of refrains from any kind of ideological imposition of how people ought to resist because he says we must be students of how people are actually resisting. So I'm curious to know that by the time of his passing, which was a fairly recent actually, what what was his his vision of social transformation for this age? What did he think people were were doing and and how could we could we learn from that and sort of related to that is that he 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 i mean the very project of of black marxism is this critique of of pre-existing ideological frameworks but i'm i'm curious to know would you at the end of his career and his life consider robinson to be a marxist and if so i mean what what i mean i guess this is his entire life's project but uh, yeah, would straightforward question is is he a Marxist? <laughs> As a and, and just to add, and just and just to add to that, because I think he, he passes away in in 2016 when when BLM when Black Lives Matter is in full swing, when there's a comeback of socialist politics in the U.S. with the with the Democratic Socialists of America and so on. Yeah, you know, of course he's he from what if you go online, like you see him, he's at events, he speaks and so on. So he's obviously into engaging with this kind of real politics too. Yeah, um, I would not label him a Marxist. I've never seen him label himself a Marxist in the sense that he even makes the distinction between the ideas of Karl Marx and organized Marxist as, a, as an intellectual project, organized Marxism mm -hmm. as an intellectual project. And in fact, if you read the early parts of his dissertation, Terms of Order, in making that distinction, he he argues that organized Marxists missed the, missed the point, one of the key points of Marx, which is not to reproduce political societies and think that you're actually freeing yourself. And that sort of becomes his critique of, at least on one level of Marxism, and then the other is extended in his 2001 book, An Anthropology of Marxism, going back to that word of anthropology. Why does he use anthropology? Because he wants to see it as a system of human culture too, meaning that ultimately, Marxism, the principle of socialism that undergirds Marxism was not invented by Marx, even in the European context. In fact, let's go back to what the struggles against these systems of power and control in Europe were before Marx comes onto the scene to understand what Marx got wrong about even European notions, right, of living against political systems and living against political order. And at the end of that particular book, he says the socialist spirit is going to endure, meaning the idea that people should live in common and, and 
exist in common and have resources that they share in common. That spirit is going to persist whether or not we call it or label it, whatever we label it. And it's a, that spirit which matters. And so I do have him uh, documented as saying, yes, I am a socialist, right? But I think to sort of label it and frame it through an intellectual genealogy was something that gave him pause. Um, and so in terms of BLM, yes, um, his, his widow, so I had a, already had a, had a book talk um, on the book and his widow was there, Elizabeth Robinson, who was an activist and organizer in her own right and an intellectual in her own right. She actually asked me the same question at the end of my last book talk. And she says, what would he say about the whole ideas about you know race and gender struggle, sexuality struggle, indigenous struggle that's happening right now? It's a difficult question because as I, as I said earlier, you know, he was against all forms of oppression. But in terms of the actual organizing that's happening right now, there are so many levels and so many different variations and so many assumptions that guide how people move about struggling against these forms of oppression. And um, there's just so much out there to, to actually say, well, he would be for this or against this. It's, it's hard to say. Um, but I think he would be very much, one thing he would say, he would be very much um, waiting for, listening for the spontaneous re revolution. He was always into that. He was always into not being able to predict and not, be, right. not being able to sort of, you know, formulate an answer mm. on pre-existing ideas about what you think should happen. Mm. And being aware of being being attentive to the spontaneity was something that he would probably say to us right now. I think he would have, would have been gratified by what happened around the world in 2020. Um, you know, Robin, Robin Kelly writes about that in the new edition to Black Marxism that came out um, last month. Connecting his ideas to what happened in 2020 was very important because a lot of that was just spontaneous. Nobody planned that, right? And so the question becomes, what do you do in the wake of it? And I think that's an ongoing question but intellectuals probably aren't in the position to act to ask me answer that question. It's the people that have to answer it. 